Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our morning service. Let's just you know, come to the Lord in prayer. To the Lord God and Father, we thank you and praise you that we can come to you and worship you in this way. We just pray that you will bless us now for about this time together. May all that is done uh, be in accordance with your will and for your glory. We ask it in our Saviour's name. Amen. 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 Boxes. But um, 
There's a leaf, there's a, in the porch, there's a, a, a leaflet there to pick up. And I think Shoebox Sunday will be the morning of Sunday, the 21st of November. And then, we've got some provisional dates here for, this is in the evening service, on the 24th of October, which I believe is Bible Sunday. A bit like we have songs of praise, we're going to ask you for your favourite Bible passages. And then, on the 21st of November, in the evening, it's our sort of annual songs of praise evening. So if you have any favourite hymns, you'd like some, then tell Chris, so she can practice in good time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and yes, the offering you box is at the back. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, yes, well, uh, thank you mentioned there for good news for everyone, for all the Gideons, and uh, it was our regional convention yesterday. It was very encouraging, particularly encouraging to us, I think, there was a one of the speakers was a, a minister in Gladlet, I've got this year, um, probably middle-aged, I suppose I should think now. We are he, um, speaking about how he first came to faith, and it's for a, a Gideon Testament that uh, he, re, uh, he uh, received uh, like a, a, at a Roman Catholic school, school, he came from a Roman Catholic background, and the school in question was, St. Thomas was more in West Lipton Sea, and he actually got this testament in the 1970s sometime. So we see how it was there, and when the word is planted, it, it can grow. Now, let, now I'll come to our next hymn, which is Take Time to Be Home. <laughs>
but through the work of your Son, our Saviour, we can come before you, confess our sins, and know your forgiveness. And Lord, we do that now as we acknowledge again that we are lost without you. But we thank you for all that you are, all that you are, and all that we can be in you, in your family. And Lord, we're concerned now at this time for many things, for many people. <coughs> we implore the, uh, the needs of, of people here, but uh, we have needs unknown to each other. Many things that would concern us, and many things that would concern us in our society at the moment, when we're, we're aware, this week especially, again, of violence, <coughs> violence on the streets, and we know we have violence in the home, violence among the young people, young people. And Lord, we know that the ultimate reason for this is seeing in the human heart of people. People have turned away from you and will not come back. And we do pray, Lord, for every effort that is made for the gospel, for the gospel to point people back to you and know forgiveness and cleansing. We pray, Lord, for every uh, organisation here within our church that seeks to do this, for the ongoing preaching of your word. And in other places as well, we do remember the other churches in the UEC, and especially this, this morning, we remember the work of Little Tottenham. But we are concerned, Lord, for the state of our society. We continue to uphold those in government, Lord, and ask, Lord, that they would, they would seek you, that, that they would be aware that there is a God in heaven to whom they must uh, give a heaven for saving as we ourselves will one day. Lord God, uh, Father, we <coughs> do uh, thank you too, though, for the many ministries that we can support where the gospel is also taken to others in this country. We continue to thank you for the work of uh, organisations like the London City Mission and the great work they do in our capital city. Thank you for the work we heard earlier a fortnight ago. We want to pray you will bless uh, uh, Lofthouse in that ministry that he's carrying out there in the mission. And Lord, we and continue to the work of Sandswell and also our service personnel. But Lord, we think of the wider scene and for the ministries that go on in other countries, especially to those who are persecuted for their faith and the violence that they suffer by them in so many places. Particularly, again, hold, hold up before you the, the uh, country of Afghanistan and many that are concerned there, but we know that your people are going are uh, particular targets for the enemy. <coughs> and we pray, Lord, that many of might be able to escape and others have known your protection at these dangerous times. And that, Lord, those organisations that minister to them as well, we thank you that there are several who, again, put their lives at risk in many places to bring help and support to the two of these people. And Lord, we uh, again, as we just remember locally as well, uh, those people on their own prayer list, there's many of them that we bring to you regularly. We just remember them again. But in particular, Beryl, um, uh, Brian, Lord, Daphne, Sherman, uh, Clive, uh, and Jessica, and uh, Jim, of course, Ben Chapel, Alan Kroger, Tony. Steve Adams, Colin Hickley, we thank you for getting in, he's there, and Jack Hickley, and Sonia, Matthew and Daniela, and Peter, and, uh, and uh, so then Jim, uh, Jimmy and Martin, Peter, and Lord, we do pray, pray for all this soon family. Lord, some of these people may not be known to us, but they're known to you and you. Just bring them before you now. And now, Lord, we just pray that you will continue with us and bless us and help us through the remaining time together this morning. We just ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, come now to our reading this morning. And
That's going to be interesting. Our reading this morning is Genesis chapter 3, verses <clears throat> 1 to 15, and it's on page 5 of our church Bible. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realised that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord. Place. <laughs> they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, but Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, of the woman you put here with me. She gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head, and you will strike his head. May God bless his word to us. Look at that passage uh, in a moment. First, uh, uh, another, uh, another hymn is going to speak, O Lord, as we come to you.
have been attending our recent Tuesday evening prayer and Bible study meetings. Uh, you may be wondering, after hearing that reading earlier, whether this morning's sermon will be just a repeat of what we've been discussing there. Well, I hope that you'll find that this is not the case. Uh, the subject on Tuesdays has been Eve as a person. The subject is, this morning is focused on that final verse that, that was read, verse 15 uh, of Genesis 3, the enmity that was foretold there between her offspring, or seed, and the serpent's seed. And how that enmity has continued through history. So I hope it will rather supplement and uh, cut across what we're studying on Tuesdays. So the title of this sermon could be the Battle of the Seeds. So at the dawn of history there in the Garden of Eden, after Satan, in the form of a serpent, had deceived Eve, and drawn our first parents into sin by disobeying God, God then pronounced a curse against the serpent, ending with these words, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Now at first they may seem strange words coming from God. Here is the God whom we know as the God of peace, declaring war, I will put enmity. But of course we know that there can be no enmity, no peace between good and evil, between life and darkness. But that happens while it has raged, raged since that time and is, in a sense, still going on today. And it will continue throughout this present age. It's a, it is a, a war for which the outcome is assured. It is also a war in which we can observe some of the divine attributes, especially God's wisdom and sovereignty. This war would range at its fiercest with the coming of Christ, with the entry of the Son of God into the human race. For well, clearly he is the promised seed of a woman who would crush the serpent's head. And so look, look, look at those words, I will put enmity. When God utters those words, he was not merely reacting to a situation that he had not foreseen. For it's something that he not only foreseen, but had actually foreordained. We can be absolutely certain that God is never taken by surprise. Nor should we think that it was merely a case of working out an overall plan and sorting out details later. Now everything was planned, it was planned right down to the last detail. In Ephesians 1, uh, verse 11 we read, In him, the phrase of Christ, we were chosen, having been predestinated according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. So if God had a plan, when was this plan conceived? The answer is in eternity. In Ephesians 1 again, verse 4, he chose us in him before the creation of the world. And by implication, this means that the whole plan of salvation was planned in every detail before the world, before the universe, before anything existed apart from God himself. Now, we can see this battle taking place at several points in the Old Testament. And we can look at some of them. It started very early in human history, in fact, with Eve's immediate offspring, the brothers Cain and Abel. When Cain was born, Eve said, With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. It may be that he thought God, that Cain himself was the promised seed and would be the world's redeemer. If this was the case, uh, well, she was so uh, sad as you discovered that otherwise. It means when he was grown up, as we well know, Cain murdered Abel, his own brother. So although Cain was the seed of Eve in a physical sense, in a spiritual sense, and that is what this war, this enmity, it is, it's a spiritual war. He is actually the seed of the serpent. Thus the Apostle John in the, in the New Testament, in his first epistle, refers to Cain as belonging to the evil one. 
And when a, later another uh, son, Seth, was born, it is plain that Eve saw the significance because she said, God has appointed me another child, or seed, in place of Abel, since Cain killed him. So the plan of God was not thwarted. Another time when we see the war arranging is again between two brothers. This time Esau and Jacob. Because Esau lost both his birthright and his blessing to Jacob, he decided to kill him. But when the moment arrived and when Esau was preparing to attack Jacob and his family, Jacob wrestled with God all night. And he's in prayer and Esau's anger was turned away. Then later, when the descendants of uh, Jacob had become a nation and were working as slaves in Egypt, Pharaoh tried to exterminate them by his instruction to have all baby boys killed. Then later still, there were the numerous attempts on David's life carried out uh, by Saul and others. And now there are other instances from the Old Testament that we could quote. Let's move to the New Testament because uh, this is a war between good and evil. The kingdom of God against the kingdom of Satan is an ascension of about one person. Notice he will crush your head for the words. He will deliver a mortal blow and suffer in return, but not fatally. You will strike his heel. In Galatians 4 4, uh, we read that when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman. I want to spend a little time with this verse because it is, a, it is so, so relevant to, to our subject. Now the promised seed of the woman who arrived, the Lord himself, our, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Saviour of the world, in exactly the way, in exactly the time appointed by God, and so that he could do nothing to obstruct God's plan. Think of those words, when the time had fully come. Do we know why this particular time was chosen by God to bring his son into the world? Well, we can certainly observe his wisdom and sovereignty being displayed in choosing this moment in time. In the first place, all the prophecies about him were complete. There had been almost an unbroken chain of prophecy from the time of Moses up, up to uh, the prophet Malachi. But then the voice of God had gone silent for 400 years until he came alive again with uh, John the Baptist. But that very silence created expectancy and longing. Jesus was not just one in a long line of many prophets. Often there is a time of gap in anticipation of something special. But there were no doubt other factors too especially with regard, with regard to the quick spread of the gospel message. You can see how this was enhanced by the changes that have taken place in the world uh, through successive world empires in the centuries between the two Testaments. One of the legacies of the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great was that Greek became the universal language of the civilised world. And is of course the original language for our New Testament. And although Rome took over from Greece as the world power, uh, that aspect didn't change. Then what Rome provided for was the, the rapid spread of the gospel through the roads and communication system and an enforced peace. So much for, then for the fullness of time, but what about the next? simple but profound statement, God sent his Son. Well, first of all, although God the Father is sent, Father and Son are always in uh, harmony, almost completely at one, and the Son came willingly. Scripture informs us as if have a, a conversation um, within the Godhead of words which the Son, at his entrance into the world, spoke to the Father. Quoting here from Hebrews, which in turn is quoting from Psalm 40, we read, Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. And I said, 
here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. So Father and Son are both involved, but so too in course of the Holy Spirit. Because we know from both Matthew and Luke's Gospel that Jesus had no human father, but was conceived through the action of the Holy Spirit. And as with other events of great significance, such as creation and the resurrection of Christ, we find that all three persons of the Trinity were involved. This meant that his coming into the world was fundamentally different from any other. When we enter the world through conception of birth, our very existence begins at that moment, actually at the moment of conception. But in the case of Jesus as God's Son, he had existed from eternity. So he was the Son of God, forsaking the splendor of heaven and becoming a man like ourselves, entering the limits of time and space of, uh, of the creature. God became man, but man, uh, quoting here, God became man, that man might become not God, but godly. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. So his divine nature, he had a humanity. And what we remember is that he retained that humanity when he returned to heaven. Is it not amazing that there is now a man in the very God here? He appears in the book of Revelation as the Lamb that have been slain. So the marks of Calvary remain as an eternal reminder of the cost of our redemption. Then those next words in Galatians, born of a woman. Our first thought on reading this might be our oh, proof text for the virgin birth. However, most commentators affirm that this is not the case. The Bible certainly teaches that the virgin birth and perfect. Paul, who wrote those words, I would have known about it. <coughs> but, <it's coughs> but it seems that he, he's not attempting to teach it here. It seems that he's merely uh, seeking to stress the humanity of Jesus as well as his divine nature, and that his actual and the actual birth itself was as normal as any other. Through all this, we see the combination of the ordinary and the extraordinary, the natural and the supernatural. Supernatural conception but a natural birth. And then finally, Galatians born under the law. Amazingly, the one who gave the law in the first place now submits to its precepts himself and perfectly fulfills it in every detail in his own life, eventually paying the penalty required by the law on behalf of others. To return now to the main theme of Battle of the Seeds, no sooner was Jesus born than the attacks of Satan commenced. Herod was the first instrument, and we all know what happened. In an attempt to do away with this new king, whom we saw as a threat, he had all the boys aged two and under in Beth Bethlehem and the surrounding area put to death, just like that. But he does not succeed. Jesus had been taken out upon his way to Egypt. Coming now to his adult life and public ministry, the, the attacks of Satan continued. There was the attempt to make him succumb to temptation in the wilderness at the start of his ministry. Later, the attempt to divert him from his mission to save sinners, when even on one occasion, the Apostle Peter, who had become Satan's unbelieving spokesman, omitting spokesman. Then there were more direct attacks on his life. Very early in his ministry, after he preached in, in a synagogue at Nazareth, the people were furious and uh, wanted to throw him down a cliff and walk through the crowd and went on his way. On another occasion at the Feast of Tabernacles, when he was teaching in a temple courts, he asked the Jews, Why are you trying to kill me? And later we find him saying to the Jews and were disputing with him claiming that they were the children of Abraham, but it was not Abraham, but the devil who was their real father. You belong to your father, the devil, he said, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning. Now those words, that he belonged to your father, the devil, the same description that the epistle John uses of Cain. In both cases, the seed of the serpent. Throughout his ministry, Jesus faced growing opposition from the Jewish leaders until he reached the point when they plotted to kill him. 
In the end, they will assist to buy a traitor from the apostolic band of twelve, Julius and Iscariot, of whom it says that Satan actually entered into him. Now, there is an expression that occurs on more than one occasion in the Gospels, that Jesus refers to his time as not yet come. What does it mean? Well, as with his entry into the world, every detail, including the exact time, had been planned. So too with his departure from the world. Before that appointed time, he used his divine power to evade his persecutors very little. Sometimes he simply kept himself away from trouble. Most of his ministry was carried out in his safer area of Galilee, rather than Jerusalem. But in those last few days prior to his death, we noticed that he deliberately went public because he knew the time had come, now come. When he instructed his disciples to, to uh, prepare the Last Supper, he said, My point of time is near. Gethsemane and the cross and all that it meant stood immediately before him. The war of the seeds was about to reach its climax. There have been some famous battles fought in history, but never one like this, from which he was to emerge the victor. When we come to the cross itself and that cry of Jesus, uh, known as the cry of der dereliction, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It might appear that the battle was still lost, but soon it was to uh, follow the victory cry. The victory cry, <coughs> it is finished. What this meant for Satan is very well by a writer in the book titled The Triumph of the Crucified. He refers to the words of Jesus, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of the world be cast out. He writes, It was through the cross that the dying one triumphed. It was through the cross that he robbed the principalities of their own. It was through death that he took away the, the might of him who had the power of him. Hence his victorious cry, It is finished. So then the ancient promise about the crushing of the serpent's head in the war of the seas was confirmed. For although Jesus had been struck, it was as it were only the hand. It was not final. On the third day he was to rise again and have the seal of his father upon his completed work and to demonstrate beyond all doubt that he was and is indeed the Son of God who has power over death. Forty days later, he will ascend in bodily form and sit at the right hand of the Father where he still is to this day, making intercession for his people. But let's remember that the events surrounding the birth of Christ always pointed to his death. Bethlehem would always lead to Calvary. Even the very, even the very, uh, same Jesus, when the name of Jesus, when the angel appeared to Joseph and told him, about the expected birth, he said, You are to give, his, uh, give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Because we know that the name Jesus means Savior. Again, when we come back to that first from Galatians, God sent his son, born of a woman, born of the Lord. Why? Right? So he did know us who are law. He came to reconcile us to God through his substitution and death. And again, Paul writing to Timothy, here is a trusty saying uh, and that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world, because that's the Christmas story and why to save sinners, and that's the Easter story. But as we come, come to the question in this war of the seeds, is this war still roaming today? And if so, are we involved in it? I've already said earlier that the war continues until Christ returns, even though that the most decisive battle in the world has been fought and Satan defeated. So how are we involved? Well, in the book of Genesis, there are a number of promises given, uh, uh, given to uh, Abraham. Sorry, I'm uh, Concerning his seed. Um, Paul, in his, uh, in, his uh, in the third chapter of Galatians, makes great play on the fact 
the word seed is used in the singular rather than, than seeds uh, in the plural. Under divine inspiration, he goes on to explain that this means that one person is in view, i.e. Christ, rather than the Jewish nation uh, uh, as a whole. This is what he says in Galatians 3.16. The scripture does not say as to seeds, that is, many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. Then, if we move on to verse 29 of that chapter, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Well, this is naturally follows that if Satan is still alive today, and he is, and Christian believers in particular are going to be a special target of his attacks. And is this not the case? When you consider the level of persecution of Christians at the present time, all this is not to deny that he is acting in many other ways in the world as well. You now, if we're still engaged in a war with Satan, uh, perhaps some concluding thoughts on the nature of that war might uh, be useful on a more practical level. Spiritual warfare, as it is called, is a very big subject and not without some controversy. What I say now might be considered a little bit controversial by some. Let us mention one thing, that spiritual warfare is, is not about casting out demons. There is no ongoing instruction for the Church of Christ to carry out such activity. So what is the nature of this warfare? Well here I'll quote another author. The teaching of the New Testament is that our fight against Satan and his hosts is an indirect conflict. We do not touch, feel, speak, with or directly engage the enemy, but we fight by using the armour and weaponry which God provides. As he tempts us as we engage in the spiritual duties which protect us, and we fight back not by verbally rushing out at demons, but by spreading the gospel and thus winning over the hearts of men and women. Uh, that guy talked about uh, fighting back by spreading the gospel. Matthew Henry, the similar vein coming in or a passage in the, in the book of Acts says, the preachers of the gospel were sent forth to carry on or to carry on a war with Satan. And as we know that Satan is the god of this age and has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ. But if the gospel is preached and the Holy Spirit opens up eyes and hearts to believe. When Satan's kingdom suffers a second, I will build my church, says Jesus, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We may not all be preachers of the gospel, but we can pray, we give support, and uh, be uh, preaching in other practical ways, and then we do the vital work of those children. If we do those things faithfully and depending upon the Lord for strength, then that is the way that believers uh, in, in this day and age uh, continue the war against Satan. But remember that the main battle, the decisive battle, was won 2,000 years ago. Let's turn now to our final hit, which is Soldiers of Christ Arise.
in the benediction. To him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to only God our Saviour and glory. Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.